Hi, I'm Jim Warren, and we're continuing the series of exploring the ideas of René Girard, and I will be using magic again to illustrate the concepts. I'm going to be using a deck of uh, playing cards, and I like to use cards to represent people. This is going to represent a, a human community. Now, you know, there are 52 cards, and they're all different, and they all have to live together in this little box. As you can imagine, tensions sometimes arise as it would for human beings. I'm going to create a state of tension among these cards so intense that it will become what René Girard calls a mimetic crisis. What is a mimetic crisis? Mimetic refers to our capacity to imitate, mime, mimetic. We imitate each other, but especially we imitate each other's desires. Parents, you've seen this a hundred times. You have a child in a room with a lot of toys, the child is playing with one particular toy. A second child enters the room. Which toy is the second child going to want? Good chance he's going to want to play with the same toy the other kid is playing with. Why? Because he copies the first child's desire. That toy looks desirable to him because the toy has already been given value by the fact that the first child desires it. Now, if that's the only toy in the room like that, guess what's going to happen? When they both reach for the toy, we have a situation of rivalry and we have conflict, sometimes even violence, depending on how spirited your child is. When those kinds of rivalries multiply and spread throughout the community, and when it becomes so intense that people ignore traditional taboo boundaries, for example, in a patriarchal culture, you might have sons becoming rivals with their fathers. Women, wives becoming rivals of their husbands. The laity becomes a rival to the priesthood. People look the same to each other. They don't respect these intrinsic, what, what used to be believed to be intrinsic differences. Those collapse. They just go after whoever they want to go after in rivalry with each other. And the society then is threatened with self-destruction and approaches a state of chaos. So that is a mimetic crisis, and that is what I'm going to use the cards to demonstrate. Now, the way I'm going to do this, I thought I'd do it like this. I'm going to take some of the cards and leave them face up. The rest of the deck I'll turn face down. And uh, let me give the deck a couple of cuts. Now, I'm going to shuffle the face down cards into the face up cards to create a state of chaos. But I'm going to do it in a way that I think will illustrate graphically the kind of violence that I'm talking about. Let's put the cards down in the cup. One night I was, let me explain this first. One night I was at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. I was doing a show there. And this guy came up to me, he was a gambler. And uh, he said to me after my show, so you know James, uh, I developed a technique for shuffling cards that I would use whenever I was playing with fast company. Guys like you. I didn't want them cheating on me. I didn't want their hands on the deck. He said, so this is what I would do. He says, I would take the deck and I'd put it down inside a cup. Then we'd invert another cup on top of that one and shuffle this way. <laughs> this way, nobody, nobody gets to, you know, cheat because they don't even have their fingers on the deck. I remembered that he showed me that when I was developing this series. And I thought, hey, this is a good way to you know, graphically connote violence. Yep, yeah, all those rivalries, those people going at it with each other. Well, let me take the deck out. I'm going to show you the result. I hope it's what I want it to be. Now, this is a one-man operation, and I'm operating the camera myself. So I'm going to do it this way. I don't switch decks. I want you to keep your eyes on the cards. I hope that it was in the screen the whole time. And let me just spread them out and see what we've got here. Oh, that's perfect. Look at that. We've got some face-up cards into face-down cards. That's exactly what I wanted to create a state of rivalry. Now, when this happens, you see what I've got here? I mean, it's like there's a queen face-to-face -face with a nine. Face-to-face. -face. It's a face-off. It's a rivalry. So the rivalries are spreading throughout the community, and that's when they start looking for a scapegoat. In this case, the scapegoat is going to be the joker. Now, there can be many kinds of scapegoats, but usually they will uh, have what Girard calls marks of a victim. Marks of a victim can be uh, that 
you've got a red back instead of uh, the blue backs, right? Or uh, you look kind of strange, kind of odd. <laughs> uh, maybe you've got a speech impediment. Maybe you're very poor and you live on the, on the uh, margins of the community rather than being a part of the mainstream. Maybe you don't have relatives or kin, so there's nobody to avenge your death after they lynch you. That's, that's always important. So those are the marks of a scapegoat, the marks of a victim. And I am going to uh, show you something. In ancient communities, it was very important that the whole community join in in lynching the victim. And they had to join in in the same way. So in Greece, for example, they had the Tarpeian Rock and everybody would form a semicircle around the victim and then they would start moving in like this and back the victim up against the edge of the cliff until finally she plunges over to her death. And that way nobody took a leading role. So if there was someone that wanted to avenge the death of the victim, they'd have to go after the entire community. Nobody stood out as the chief persecutor. Stoning served the same purpose. Who can tell when the final stone killed the guy. Who, who threw the final stone? The stone that actually did him in? There's no way of knowing. So if you want to take vengeance, who are you going to go after? You see? So it was very important that the whole community join in on this. Now let's take the scapegoat and place him into the community. All right? Watch. I'm going to shuffle the cards again. This time I'm going to be demonstrating a different type of violence. Once again, let me bring this up and try to keep the deck in camera at all times because I am not switching decks. We'll place the deck back into the cup. Cover again. And let's have another go at it. But this time it's a different type of violence. It's not the violence of all against all, it's the violence of all against one as the community beats up on that scapegoat. Everybody joins themselves together to do this guy in. I'm getting a cathartic release just shaking this thing up. All right? Now, what does this accomplish for the community? What it accomplishes is it reestablishes order. It brings everybody together. It affirms those relationships that were on the verge of self-destruction because now they've been directed against this this victim, you see. Uh, you can imagine somebody in the community saying, hey, that guy was evil. He was an evil sucker, powerfully evil. It's because of him that Farmer Joe's cattle died. He's the one that caused Mary's son to have the whooping cough. That guy was a demon. That guy had the evil eye. It's a good thing we did him in. We're a good people. We're a strong community. We know how to get rid of the evil among us. Why, I feel better already, don't you guys? I think things are going to start improving around here now that we put our finger on the real culprit. Bear in mind, he's saying this to people who only a minute before he, he was enemies with. <laughs> people that he was locked into envious rivalries with. You can see how the community would experience this as almost like a miraculous healing. A restoration. And that's why victims of these kinds of collective crimes, victims were retroactively portrayed in mythology, not just as evil demons, but as gods of blessing. Because the murder of the scapegoat, or the expelling of the scapegoat, really was a kind of blessing for the community, at least temporarily. So that's what it accomplished for the community. What did, what did it accomplish for the, for the cards? Well, let's take a look. Once again, I'm gonna bring the cards over here, and I don't switch decks. So I will try to keep this in frame the whole time. Okay? Now, if I did this properly, then order will be restored to the cards. And that means not only that they, are all, they all should be facing the same way. Remember, I had face up mixed with face down. Now they are all facing the same way. But more than that, order the hierarchical orders are restored. In medieval society, as well as many other societies, the top of the hierarchy was the king. And indeed, I managed to mix those cards even without touching them so that the king is on top. But actually, I've got another king on top, and the third king is on top, and indeed, I'm going to get the last one. Yep, the fourth king on top. The kings dominate the hierarchy. 
One thing I didn't tell you about that gambler, <laughs> he actually used that as a technique for cheating himself because he figured out a way to control the cards even when they're in the cups. And that's what I tried to do in order to illustrate this concept for you. But remember that the whole community joined in on the lynching of that victim. So order is restored, not just on the top of the hierarchy, but order is restored the whole way down the chain. And as you can see, believe it or not, I've arranged the cards through the shuffling process that I've got the four queens, the four jacks, the kings, the nines, the eights, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and ace. The entire order of the society is restored and the only price they had to pay was the life of a measly, single, solitary scapegoat. You know, when Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, if he would just bow down and worship him, this is the kind of kingdom he was offering. Kingdoms built on the murder and exclusion of victims. So you can see how radical it was when Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God, which was a kingdom in which every single life was valuable, had infinite value as a member of the family of God. A kingdom in which the king would rather serve at the bottom than dominate from the top. A kingdom in which the king did not scruple to stoop down and wash the dirty feet of illiterate fishermen. Now that's a pretty amazing kingdom, folks. A kingdom in which the king is actually willing to become a scapegoat himself with the hopes that we might learn something about what we do and how we form community and maybe we can change things. Maybe we can build a community that's not based on scapegoating, but a community of love for the neighbor.